And then, you know, we've talked to ISVs and we're like, hey, partner with us. Right. You know, we'll mm -hmm. help you with a go to market strategy. Right. And some of them are open to that. And some of them are like, no, why would we do that? Patty, I really enjoyed the episode today with Alan Kopelman. Uh, yes. You know, just so much experience. He's been in the business for oh. over 20 years and, mm -hmm. you know, really, I think, has a pulse for practical advice for the ISOs. I think is the best way I would put this one. It's hard yeah, to Yeah, I think it's a great way to put interview. it. Yeah. And yeah. he's been around, you know, he's been part of the, the regional, you know, scene, uh, association yes. scene for a while. I've run into him a lot. He's very well respected. I think this this B2B um, vault. Yeah, vault um, podcast. podcast he has is, is a really interesting example of what ISOs and even agents can do to kind of differentiate themselves. Yeah, I, in my opinion, I think this is probably the most practical conversation I've ever had on the podcast regarding real content marketing for what mm -hmm. an ISO would like, what it, that would actually look like. So I thought that was really right. cool. We, I followed that up with just a real quick, uh, you know, follow-up thoughts on content marketing for the ISOs and agents that are, you know, going to be practical, that are going to generate leads. And then tell right. us about the insiders. Well, then I talk about regulation of fintech. Um, you know, it's been sort of something in the background for a while, but it, it does seem to be coming to the forefront. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, Alan Kopelman and his uh, his company, uh, they're not sponsors or consulting clients or anything like that of of, of us. Uh, and so uh, this is just a great interview with an industry expert. So with that in mind, yes. let's dive in. Hey, everybody. Patty and I are here today with Alan Kopelman, who is the CEO and founder at Nationwide Payment Systems, also is the uh, has his own podcast called B2B Vault. So Alan, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Hey, Alan. I mean, yeah, no, you've been a, you've been around. A, you've been a friend of the green sheet for many years. So, uh, our yeah, aren't you doing, that's actually right. Aren't you doing the uh, feet or what is it called? The feet on the street or whatever, right? Yeah, street smarts. Street, street smarts. smarts. That's what that's it's called. Right. right. Yeah, starting in March, I'll be doing street smarts. Oh, right. Fantastic. Right. Awesome. And right now, I know you're on the homepage for you know, sort of like the our 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 our, our homing Future in on industry. Uh, you know, nice movers okay. and shakers. Awesome. Well, Alan, so for those that maybe don't know you so well, uh, give us a story. How did you get into this crazy industry? And then tell us about your kind of journey to where you're at today. So I got into this industry was kind of crazy. I used to be a chef, you oh. see, like a picture back there on yeah. the wall. And I did, I did. And um, I ended up um, exiting out of my restaurant because the lease got, we got kicked out of the lease. Okay. And uh, so then I said, oh, what am I going to do? So I, one of my friends was doing credit card processing in Atlanta. He said, oh, you should get into the credit card processing business because I'm making great money. So I ended up working for this company for about a year and a half. And people were asking for all sorts of things like check services, ACH, right. authorized.net, uh, getting data cap files for their you know a var sheet for a pos system and they were like no we're not doing that we're just selling machines blah 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 so i decided to look into it and then a uh, big shout out jr's pos depot the right. owner riyad was working he did, that wasn't even open yet he was working at this place called unipay and he gave me two copies of the green sheet and he goes, you're smart. He goes, you can figure it out. You could start <laughs> one of these companies. So me and another friend of mine, Dave, decided we started the company January 2001. Wow. wow. So, so that's like 23 years coming up on 23 years. 20, right? Yeah, coming yeah. up on 23, right? Yeah. So we've been going at it for over two decades. Wow. And uh, you know, it's a great business. You know, it's yeah. a definitely... We've seen it all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. In 20 okay. years, a lot has happened. Indeed. I mean, I tell people all the time when I talk to sales reps, I go, you guys have it so easy today. You got electronic applications. Right. You have cash discount. You have all these great things that you can go POS systems. We couldn't sell. We didn't sell POS system. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't even a POS system to sell. Right. right. And we had to do paper applications, press hard, white, yellow, green, pink, then take that <laughs> and overnight it to the bank with a bunch of Polaroid pictures. Right. Oh, I remember. I remember doing that. I mean, I remember my first, probably my first uh, 40 mids, I, which I was kind of at the tail end of that, you know, which was, I guess, 13 years ago. 
But I mean, yeah, I had to, it was like try copy and I had to tear it apart and, and then I had to like literally go down to the FedEx and I had like a sticker I had to put and overnight everything in. And oh, it was a, it was a mess. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it was a lot of, you know, a lot of work. And then over the years, I, I couldn't even tell you, we've, we've probably disposed of at least a ton or more of hardware from all right. the upgrades of yeah. pin pad iterations and yes. terminals that went out and, right. you know, customers get new terminals and they're mailing them back to us. And then thank goodness we found a company that actually comes and picks, picks up that stuff and disposes of it properly. Yeah. Well, um, okay. So let's do this. So since you're bringing up these two decades, right, let's talk about that. So in two decades, what are the biggest shifts or trends that stand out to you that just really change the way that your ISO, you know, operated? What were the big shifts? Um, wow. EMV was, people didn't believe when EMV was coming out. All, we had tons of, we had equipment stacked up, like a, a few hundred terminals. Right. And telling everybody, listen, you got to get this. You got to get these. got to get these, right? No, no, no. Then all of a sudden, like when that date came, it was in October mm -hmm. 2015, and it was all over like every news channel. Oh, you're going to get loads of chargebacks. All of a sudden, the phone, we sold more equipment in the end of 2015, like the last half of 2000, than we sold the previous like five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. you know, Wouldn't surprise me. And the other big thing was, you know, the free terminal thing changed this business a lot. You know, yeah, yeah. that changed the business a, a, a lot, a big time. That was, th those are big changes that really, you know, and then today, you know, one of the things that a lot of old school merchants won't get out of their head is this whole tip after the sale thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they would just do tip at the time of the sale, they're, they, they would alleviate tons of chargebacks we see restaurants they call us every week we really chargeback the bill was 100 the person left 50 bucks and the chips being charged back nothing we can do like you got you know we told you you know a hundred times like use these terminals right. take it to the table all authorized together guess what no more problems yeah yeah, yeah. well okay so I love that you brought these up so far. Those are so interesting. We can almost do a whole podcast episode on, on oh, each yeah. of those, right? But, but but one other one I want to touch on, of course, is this macro trend of integrated payments. So you mentioned how when you were starting out, there wasn't even a point of sale system to sell. Now it seems like, you know, we've had this shift in focus. What are your thoughts on the direction of this like integrated payments in our industry and specifically for the ISO? I know you and I talked uh, recently about this and some of the processor agnostic ones and all that, like, how do you see this kind of playing out and, and what are your thoughts on the integrated payment shift? I think, you know, especially with, um, now I'm going to lose my mind, especially with, you don't have to integrate payments into an application anymore. You have a semi-integrated solution. Right. Well, that alleviates a ton of, a ton, a ton of money that does not have to be spent by these companies. So companies can come out with apps and point of sale and just do a semi-integrated solution. And we're gonna see hundreds and hundreds because now before people made applications to make SaaS revenue, now these guys are getting smart and going, oh, what kind of SaaS product can I make that solves a problem? And how can I get payments in there and figure out how to do mm -hmm. it effectively? Right. Most of them, I don't think are doing it effectively because they're trying to just go to market. They have no marketing budget. Right. They don't have a plan that have no marketing plan. And then they go partner with a whole, there's a, you know, a host of pay facts, right. That they go partner with. And then those pay facts don't help them make sales. Right. I think that those right, type right. of companies need to come to, ISOs, small ISOs, make deals, do private labels to in order to get to get the sales engine going for stuff like that. Because otherwise they're just lost in a sea of every a sea. I mean, I've seen people go yeah. out and have 10 clients. I'm like, well, why don't you have more clients? Oh, we don't have distribution. Well, you know, how you know, yeah. you got to get distribution to to get that going. And a lot of ISOs are buying up. Um, point of sale companies and software, cloud software or right. type software, 
And as a sales rep, those are the those are the companies that you need to go partner with because they own the whole thing. They own the the the, the software product and the payments. Maybe mm -hmm. you'll make a little less money, okay? But in the long run, you're going to end up keeping those customers longer. So yeah, those yeah. are things to look at, you know, for, for the long run. And I think that the agents who are out there constantly searching for payment agnostic uh, solutions are going to find themselves where we've all, where, you know, I found myself, oh, you were payment agnostic. <laughs> yeah, I was payment agnostic. Now we got bought by a payment processor or we decided to partner with one and we're going to try to steal all your customers because right. now there's a new owner, you know? Yeah. So that's a big problem in our industry, you know, let alone that some of the companies that the agents that listen to this podcast help build and sell. And now those companies are selling direct. And, right. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's interesting, Alan, because we, we like started this conversation the other day, but we, we didn't really go kind of very far with it. I, I'm actually curious to get your thoughts. Like I go back and forth on it where sometimes I feel like it's the technology company is to blame. Sometimes I feel like the ISOs and agents are to blame. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, these ISOs and agents will go to these tech companies and it's like, oh, yeah, we'd love to sell your software with payments. And we want to make sure we get 90 percent, 80 percent of mm -hmm. the payment processing profits. And, and make sure you don't sell payments though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, you uh -huh. know what I mean? Two years from now, they're going to go, screw you. Like, obviously we're going to do our own payment processing and try to steal your clients because you're keeping 90% of the profit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is there, is there an equitable solution to bring the ISOs and ISDs together? Or is it just kind of like two different worlds that, you know what I mean? It seems like everybody's clashing between these I two worlds. I think companies have to decide what they're, you know, what they're going to do and not, I mean, listen, we have Clover, right? Look at right. Clover. Today, we get customers call us up. Oh, we want Clover. We give them the price. They go, it's cheaper on the website. We, we can't help you, you know? So, you know, that's a really glaring example. But the, the thing is, is that you have to be a good partner. And yeah. they have to make money. And we have to understand that those companies need to make money. Right. As soon as, you know, I get reps, they'll come to me. I want a 90% split. I'm like, oh, good for you. Go that. find I go, it. <laughs> I go, I'm trying to run an office. Okay. I have five employees. I go, I've got a, a you know, a space that we pay rent on. We have phones. We have a website. We're providing you with tons of marketing material. We're, we're doing everything that we can do, but we can't give you 90%. And right. if somebody is giving you 90%, I'm not sure what's on the schedule way. Okay. So or what or is ninety percent of? Well, the right. other thing, <laughs> right? Well, the other thing I think that's that's interesting there is too, your split. The other big question is going to be, what are you getting? Maybe the schedule A is clean, right? But then, right. what is that company doing? Like you brought up, you know, marketing materials. Um, you know, do, do they mm -hmm. have these strategic relationships? Because again, if if you know, if you look at it, and you're like, well, I'm selling for this ISO, and then they've got this technology solution that they want you to sell, and it's a different company. Well, mm -hmm. then the technology company and the ISO and you all need to make money from that merchant. Exactly. So, That's why it's better to partner with an ISO that has, that has purchased a technology company. There's right. quite a few of them out there. Right. Some of them haven't, they buy these tech. The other thing is I see ISOs buy a technology company. Then they don't know how to take that product and give it to the agents. Right. right? So they have, like we work with one company now. They have like four solutions. I'm like, well, we could be going out selling some of these solutions. Why can't we sell them? Well, we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I get it. I mean, there's, I talked to one the other day on a really big company everybody would know, and they have a huge agent ISO channel, one of the largest. And they also in the last uh, you know few years have acquired uh, over 20 vertical specific ISVs. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, I said, what does the agent program look like? to get the agents to sell the ISVs. And like, we don't have that yet. And I was like, wow. Wow. really? I mean, they have a really? huge, huge ISO agent channel. And then they have this totally separate ISV and there's just zero crossover. And, and, and again, I think it's because there's just, there hasn't been a realization of value exchange between the ISOs and agents, right? The ISOs are like, well, we're bringing all the value. We're making the sales. If we didn't make the sales, nothing would happen. And the ISV is like, what are you talking about? We're the software company. That's all they care about. We're bringing all the value. And it's like, mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. you need each other. And so there's just hasn't been like, you know what I'm saying? So it, yeah, I, I think, the, I mean, it's going to change, you know, but some of the biggest companies in our industry have bought 
massive amounts of companies. I don't want to name the names unless right. you want me to, but they bought massive amount of companies right. and then all that stuff's just sitting on the shelf and they don't really have anybody selling it. And that, and I don't understand. Yeah, that's what you were saying. Right. I mean, that yeah. was your point in, in yeah. the first place, like, or like James was just explaining about the company that bought up all these technology companies and keeps it, keeps a Chinese wall between them and the, and right. its sales staff. I mean, duh. And then, you know, we've talked to ISVs and we're like, Hey, partner with us. Right. You know, we'll mm -hmm. help you with a go to market strategy. Right. And some of them are open to that. And some of them are like, no, why would we do that? And then I'm like, well, you know, um, you yeah. sell your, don't you want to have more sales? I mean, we're looking for industry vertical, right. You know, solutions so that we can go, we can sell that to people. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Know, yeah. But, but, you know, I was telling one guy that has a SaaS company, I go, how many merchants do you think you need to be successful? The guy goes, 100,000. I go, first of all, where are you going to get the staff, right? Uh -huh. To the sell support? that. No, forget support. the staff. It's, yeah, to support, support it, yeah. To support the 100,000 merchants. The guy's like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, I said, if you're a SaaS company and you're able to get, let's say, 500, 1,000, let's say 2,000. That's that's a multi million dollar company right yeah, there. Yeah. You don't need huge penetration like like Toast, right? Right. It's not like right. you're going after the entire market. You're going after a particular segment of the market, right? Well, even, Just even get your salons or pizza, going, going or pizza shots or you're whatever. Going after a slice of that segment, right? Right. Yeah. Just go after yeah. a piece of it. Get your yeah. two thousand merchants. Have a manageable staff, right? Where you're, all of a sudden you're not going like, oh, we're toast, and now we have a hundred thousand restaurants, yeah, yeah. We got thousands of employees, and the payroll, and you know, which I, you know, I've never understand all these big companies that have negative, you know, the profits negative. Yeah, it um, wasn't the way we were taught taught to start businesses. <laughs> well, you know, well, it, what it does, it's interesting, Alan. It actually speaks to a point you made a little bit ago, which is. ISVs and, and and even the pay facts like Toast, they just never had a great distribution model from the beginning. And so when you look at Toast, it's really obvious. The reason they're losing all this money is because of their cost of acquisition. And so when you have this idea of like, well, you have to, for your, for your shareholders, you have to grow X amount every year, revenue, you know, top line, well, then you got to buy those customers. And when you look at how much Toast pays per new client, it mm -hmm. just blows your mind versus well, wait a minute, look at the ISOs. They haven't figured out, you know, our cost of acquisition in the ISO market is like so tiny compared to what these other companies are doing. And so it, I, I, it, I talk about it all the time, but I definitely feel like the, the big opportunity for the next 20 years is going to be the companies that solve the problem, bringing the ISOs and ISVs together. It's going to yeah. be the same thing with like point of sale. Like I think there's a few companies that have it right. Hardware and software as a service. Yep. And mm -hmm. as long as they have the capital to put out to right. buy that hardware and put it out there yep. and they can get it to an affordable level. I think they're going to see a, yeah. a lot of success. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's just shift gears a little, if you guys don't mind, because I want to talk about what you're doing today in terms of marketing and where you're getting your leads and, and, and sales, where, where all, you know, the, your pipeline, where is that emanating from? So one of the things that we started doing way before COVID hit was I was doing personally a ton of remote sales. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're selling a lot of cloud applications, a lot of non-card present. And a lot of that, those leads are coming from blogging, LinkedIn. You know, we, we've gotten two or three very large customers because of the podcast. I mean, that's actually helped retain some clients. But mm -hmm. having, you know, putting out content, which is a lot of work, James. Mm, uh, yes, as I know, <laughs> James too. Because you're <laughs> yeah. writing articles and, you know, those kind of things, you know, while it takes, takes time. time. And, you know, we did a lot of organic SEO. And we've also, we changed one of the things with our website. So when we first started, the web first website was NPSbank.com. Because when you would go out and call on merchants, the first thing they would say is, oh, I'm with my bank. Mm -hmm. Today, we don't hear that so much. Today, people say I'm with PayPal, Stripe, Square, QuickBooks. Right, right. You know, those are the names we hear a lot. So then we developed the website nationwidepaymentsystems.com. We changed the look and feel of that because payment systems is a better right. Uh, right. SEO word. And, you know, that drives more traffic. And, you know, 
and also the other thing that we did was we built a very good referral network. Mm, so that mm -hmm. was really, really important. So that's really you know, key these days. Yeah. So different people like um, restaurant and bar um, mm -hmm. consultants, um, people that make websites, digital marketers, um, accountants, which that's not easy accountants but we have a couple and we have some like business advisors that do like business advising to um franchises and people like that like they're uh -huh. attorneys and accountants sure. and so we so we work with a a, a large group of referral partners and we uh -huh. pay them residual obviously that's the right them coming some of them want just like a one-time a one-time spiff uh -huh. And we also try to work, you know, try to, you know, tell them like, hey, we're we're looking for the hard case. Like, right, right. A client, they can't find the right solution. They, mm -hmm. don't, they don't know where to turn. They have like a really not, maybe not so complicated, but they have a sales process that, you know, they're not talking to somebody that truly understands like what's the sales process that's mm -hmm. going or they're doing tremendous volume. And, you know, they want to get better pricing. So right. we'll, we'll take on somebody that's doing tremendous. We have some clients doing millions. Okay. And, you know, we go to our partners and we say, hey, you know, we want to bring you this client and this is the pricing that they want. And, you know, what can we do? And we know you can't pay us what you're normally paying. We'll take a 50-50 split on the deal because it's going to bring in a good amount of revenue you know top line revenue yeah. and that's where you got to work with your iso partners and to get to be able to bring those deals in if you're going to go to somebody and go i got a five million dollar deal and i want to keep it all myself i want 80 percent <laughs> right and margins then they're going to be like we're not really interested in that yeah yeah that's yeah. where you gotta you know have those conversations and go hey well we'll take 60 percent or 70 percent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it's better than zero. Right, right. You know. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. But refer getting referrals is key. Referral key. To your clients. You know, and other things we've done, like we have a newsletter that goes out once a month. We post it on LinkedIn. We post it on Facebook. We post it everywhere. And we just keep keep the content rolling. Right, know? right. No, content is 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 critical. Okay, let me, if you don't mind, I want to kind of switch back again to where you and James were talking a minute or two ago about this whole integrated payments idea, the idea, and and how this has changed your approach to, to clients um, and the complexity around processing, say, versus 10 years ago or even 20 years ago when you first started out. Well, one thing is, I think business owners today, let's segment them into two categories you have younger business people like under the age of 40 mm -hmm. and above 40 people under 40 are not calling picking up the phone calling us up right right so we have to figure out a way to attract those people they're just going to the quick quick fast and easy paypal strikes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we have to do a better job of 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 getting those those people but i think today business owners are looking for a product. They're looking for a solution. That's why they buy toast. They don't buy mm -hmm. toast because they toast has a great price. Toast price is insane. Yeah. Okay. okay. The what what they charge for processing is 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 ridiculous. I mean, it's high. Okay. Let's right. just let's be real. They charge a high price for processing, and then the hardware is not so pr pr highly priced, and the monthly fee. And then that's how, you know, but people are more interested in the product right. than merchant services. Right. Nobody cares about merchant services. They don't care what the rate is. If you have the right product that fits into their business, mm -hmm. they'll pay you what you, they'll, they'll pay whatever rate you tell them. I mean, pretty much, you know. Yeah. That, yeah. But I think people are more interested in the, and, you know, how does this help my business? How does this solve my problem? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So let's, you know, one of the things I wanted to dig into a bit more, you mentioned a couple of times about the podcast. I mentioned it at the beginning, uh, B2B vault is the name of the podcast. <clears throat> Talk to me a little bit, give our, give our audience kind of the short version of like, 
what what prompted you to start a podcast for business owners? I've talked about doing it many, many times. And, you know, oh, you need to do this. And everybody I talked to, I'm like, have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? And I was like, oh my, I could never do that. So talk about what prompted you to start this podcast and, you know, and, and get this going. So I always wanted to do, like, I did blogging, but, you know, people don't really read that much. And, you know, and then I said, you know, I really want to do a podcast, but I couldn't figure it out. And it was, you know, I was looking at all the equipment and everything, and it was right. quite expensive. And then one day I entered a contest from uh, AppSumo, which is a this guy Noah Kagan at a contest. I wrote in, I said, oh, I want to do a podcast. I ended up winning like $900 worth of tech gear. Ooh. Cool. So I got my first microphone and my first camera. We have many cameras and many microphones since then. Yeah. And I just decided, the, I would say, you know, and then one of the things I learned from him was, is, you know, you really got to commit to a hundred, you know, that you're going to do a hundred. Mm -hmm. And, right. uh, you know, the first 20 were really horrible. Probably the first 50 weren't that great. And then, you know, I got Justin my website guy to come on the podcast and sit, you know, and then it changed and changed and changed. And, you know, we changed the studio around and how it looked and the furniture and the backdrop. And now it's all, you know, completely different. And we, you know, and, and we just try to come up with, you know, subject matter and, you know, we keep it to, we change the format of it around a little bit. You know, we just try to come up with subjects that business owners are not aware of. And we talk about stories in the news and how does that relate to your to your thing, uh, to, to business owners. And so we're trying to give them relatable information. And, you know, we have pretty good sized listener base of people looking at the podcast and the reels and the short videos and things like that. And it's, you know. I mean, listen, it's not, I've had, I had a guy call me one day on the phone. I answered the phone. Hello, this, you know, nationwide payment systems. Hey, this is Alan. The guy's like, he goes, wow, you answered the phone. <laughs> and right. she, he goes, you have a podcast. I'm like, okay, yeah, so, and whatever. And that person is now a customer. So. Yeah, I've, you know, I've been saying, I've been saying for years that, that fame is actually one of the most under valued mm -hmm. assets right now because uh -huh. with social media marketing and all the things you can do it's actually really really inexpensive yeah to create you know some version of local fame right i mean like when i was selling payment processing it was very common for me to walk into a business that i'd never been into before and the person would be like hey aren't you james shepherd the guy you know because i had videos that were going out i was doing I would pay $500 and get 50,000 people to see my video in my local market. And, you know, and, and I would do that all the time. And I would send newsletters out with my picture on it. And I would do, a, we, had, we had a Facebook group for local business owners and I was the admin. And so, you know, it didn't cost me hardly anything, but like when you walk into a place or somebody calls you and it's like, it's really you, it's like, yeah, it's really me. I'm, I'm actually just a normal guy. It just, I put some work into getting this, you know, kind of quote unquote fame. Right. And it's, it's very, very valuable. Okay. I think especially agents that are in, I mean, we're in a big market, South Florida. Okay. Right. But if you're in a small market, I think that's even way, way more effective. Because yes. you'll be the you're only one. Small. Nobody, hey. nobody else is going to have a small business Facebook group or a small business podcast for your little tiny county or your. Yeah, like if you were in some place, my daughter lives in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. If you were in right. Cedar mm -hmm. Rapids, Iowa, and you did this, that kind of marketing plan, you would be super popular. Everybody would know who you were. Yep. Right, right, right. Places like that. And I think a lot of agents don't don't think like, okay, I can do that and right. create like a whole persona and create a whole business around that. Right, right, right. Hey, can, can you give us an example of, uh, you know, how how maybe you've been leveraging content marketing on social media and how it's impacted? Um the company from a lead generation, sales generation perspective? Well, you know, you got, it's a lot of work. You got to produce articles. I mean, I have a graphic designer in the office. We have mm -hmm. someone doing video. We have a guy that's doing our website all the time. And so, you know, you got to really, you know, people, you just can't stick a website up and then that's And it. expect You're people done. to come to it, right? So, you know, and Google is always changing the uh, algorithm. You know, one thing that I always discuss is advertising 
right? There's no, there's no level playing field for advertising. When I first started in this business, I would say that advertising uh, was more, le the, the playing field was a lot more level. So give you an example. We, when we first started, we had an ad in the yellow pages says we fix credit card machines. <laughs> and I want to tell you, we got ton we got one of our largest customers that ended up until they went bankrupt that about 130 locations right we landed that customer through that ad because people would call up i have a broken credit card machine the company wants me to buy a new one it's 400 dollars. blah 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 and we'd go over there and we'd say oh if you sign up with us we'll fix it for free and we're lucky we have jr's pos depot down the street and we had plenty of t7ps and we just throw a P7P in, get an application filled out, boom, boom, boom. And, you know, the next thing you know, you got a, you got a client. Right. So, you know, but the, the, the playing field is not level today. Google, I mean, listen, uh, Stripe, Square, PayPal, whoever, they can go spend more money in one day than I can spend in a year. Right. So, you know, putting the content out there is a way to, you know, attract people and then they see it enough times and they go, Oh, let's call this company. Let's talk to them. And right. You know, and that's how you get customers or even clients that you're considering, you know, they're going to go out and they're going to go look at your website mm -hmm. and maybe look at your blog. Uh, they'll go check you out on LinkedIn. They're going to go look at your BBB. You know, that's what people do that, you know, I don't know if they put so much into re I don't think people like believe reviews so much anymore because there's been a lot of abuse in that. Well, well, it's like, I think Alan, the point you're bringing up though is so valid because they don't look at, you know, they don't put a lot of stock in the reviews unless that's the only thing they have to go on. Right. When, right. When right, people, right. when people look you up and they're like, wow, let me watch this podcast let me read this article. Let me see their LinkedIn profile. And they're like, okay, I, I get a feel for this company and a feel for this person. They're like, okay, that's what I believe. If you just leave it to like, well, I'm not going to put anything out there. Well, then they're going to have to believe whatever's out there. And if whatever's out there is one cranky customer or mm -hmm. scammer that left a nasty review about you, then that, that's going to leave a little seed of doubt, you know, in their mind. Right. Yeah. So, I, mean, I think it's important, you know, like I used to do a ton of networking too, like go to networking groups right. all mm -hmm. the time and, and all that. And I think if you're getting started in the business, that's a really effective way to market to be involved in a lot of networking groups and, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't say chambers because I'm not a big fan of chambers or associations because I think a lot of them just take your money. You don't get value out of it. So you want to do, you want to look at whatever you're doing and see like, Oh, is there is am I getting value? You know, sure. am I getting, am I getting results? If you're not getting results, move on, go do something else. Sure. Well, Alan, as, uh, as we kind of wrap this up, and it's so interesting because I the whole content marketing is like this conversation that I never get to have with people in our industry. So I'm enjoying right, this. Right, right. Um, it's a conversation you and I tend to have with each other because yeah, we, we can't talk have about it with it, other people. Nobody, yeah. <laughs> no, this is really cool. I, I think you've really maybe opened the eyes of our audience a little bit to see like, okay, like you could actually do this. I think that's great. Um, mm -hmm. But as we wrap this up, what I'd love to hear from you is, you know, final thoughts. Is there any kind of piece of advice that you would give for the ISO that's maybe they've been in the business 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and they're seeing, you know, how it's a lot harder to get out there and walk in and just cold. So, you know, to, cause I got to sell people that are using toast or square or stripe or whatever it is. Um, what advice would you give them to become more relevant? What do you, what do you wish somebody would have told you sooner? Maybe. I don't know if I, anybody would have told, I think if I, I don't know, you, you have to, you have to really think hard about, like I've talked to people and they go, oh, I want to make my own POS. I think that's just too expensive. I think if you're in the business and you want to maximize what you're doing, I think you got to find the right partner, get, you know, let them offer you the split they're going to offer you, learn how to sell whatever product it is they have, a POS, a software product, and work with them. And that's how you're going to, that's how you're going to grow. That's how you're going to grow your business. Yeah. Trying to piece together all these agnostic pieces together. I think in another couple of years that most of those companies are going to either be gone or get bought by somebody or partner with the payment processor. And then it's going to be very, very difficult, you know, 
to look at. I mean, I've seen people in the Facebook group that that James has, and there were some people in there recently, and they're like, oh, this POS company got sold to this other company, and now they're stealing all the customers. We actually lost two large restaurants to that. There was nothing we can do. And the company went and forked over to the merchant a whole boatload of cash, too, on right. top of that. So, you know, that's just something that I think people need to really forget about this whole agnostic thing. Um, I refuse to work with these agnostic companies. I don't believe them because I think one day they won't be agnostic anymore because once they sell, they sell. And then that right. person told you they're agnostic has, Isn't there. Yeah. has no say anymore and you're basically right. done. So yeah I, yeah, I mean, it's like, think of it from a buyer's perspective, right? If you went out, if you were a, let's say you're a private equity firm and your job is to buy companies and make them three times more valuable than they are today in seven years. Like that's basically what you're supposed to do as a private right. equity firm. So you buy this company and they're a processor agnostic point of sale solution. And they have 5,000 hair salons using their processor agnostic solution. <clears throat> you come in as the buyer. You now have to triple the value of the company. What do you do? Payments. <laughs> Payments. You didn't make promises to anybody. You didn't tell anybody you were going to stay agnostic. You didn't tell anybody that was your plan. You just bought the business. What are you going to do? I know someone who just did that in the salon business. A guy came in, bought this salon software company that was barely surviving off SaaS revenue. Boom. He put in payments and, yep. you know, he 10 X the company. Right. So it's, yeah. it's, it's just, it's happening and it's happening so much that it's, it's just difficult, I think. And there are some good processor agnostic companies, I think still, but it, but to your point, it's like, it's really going to be tougher and tougher for them to not take the buyout offer or to not do the, the payment processing just because from a market perspective, like, Man, they, there's a lot of untapped value there, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, believe yeah. me, I've been on phone calls where they're like, well, we're very sorry to tell you, but they don't own the company anymore. We own the company. We're going to do whatever we want. And I'm right. like, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so, they don't want to so share revenue. Is. And a lot of them don't want to share revenue. And we built their, you know, where'd they get the 5,000 customers right. from the sales community? Right. And then they just take them and they just flip them and then that's it. You're done. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, you know, so there's I, not a lot we can do with that. I mean, I think you just got to rethink the today. I think you just got to rethink the business, you know, and the other thing I think people need to think about is, is this cash discount train going to keep going mm -hmm. or is there going to, is it going to come to a halt? I mean, mm -hmm. You know, we saw the video from the guy at w WSAA, right? The guy from Visa. I would love right. to get him on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Robert Johnson, come on the podcast with me and Jane and Patty. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, you know, if that, if, 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 if something happens to that, um, I think that a lot of, a lot of uh, the newer ISOs and sales reps are going to have a very hard time. Mm -hmm. surviving yeah, yeah. and you've yeah. got to sell a mix i know a lot of guys are like no i'm not selling that merchant they don't want cash discount i'm like just give me the phone number I'll sign them right up. right yeah you got you still want to build those up otherwise you're going to get top heavy with portfolio so yeah, well sure. alan this has been uh so interesting i'm sure we'll have you on again there's so many other topics in here to discuss and uh i'm sure at some point we will get him on the podcast by the way so we're working on that so but oh, um, I would love to be a guest with that. I got yeah, yeah. questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, me too, right? Well, Alan, <laughs> thanks so much again for your time. So before yeah, thanks, we let you Alan. go, for those who want to contact you, learn more about your business, where would you send them to connect or learn more? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Alan Kopelman. You can go to the website, nationwidepaymentsystems.com. B2B Vault is on every single uh, podcast you know, app that there is, Spotify, you know, et cetera, ex Apple. Those are the two biggest ones. I yeah, mean, we're on YouTube, sure. so we video it, but we post a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. Um, you want to reach out, reach out to me on LinkedIn and we can talk awesome. about what we're doing and maybe how we can help you or, you know, yeah. maybe merchants listening or sales reps. You know, I've given, I've mentored quite a few people, even that haven't worked for me. They call me up and just pick my brain. And, yep. You know, I tell them, I go, you, you know, you just got the one thing I will say to agents is read your contracts. Yes. Right? Yeah, there you go. And, and pay, pay a lawyer 500 or a thousand bucks. It'll be the best. 
best money you ever spent because you'll yeah. make sure that you're going to get paid. And there's, and if there's any pitfalls in the contract, they're going to go yeah. find that for you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Very, very important for your for sure. Long- Great. Great wisdom there for sure. So, well, Alan, thank you so much again for taking your time and sharing your insights with our audience from your experience and really appreciate it, man. Hope you have a fantastic day. You yes. too. Thank you for having me on. Peace. Thanks for being here, man. Well, this episode is brought to you by Nativia Banking Services. Of course, Patty talks a little bit about that in the insiders today, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I'd really encourage you, if you have not done so already, head over to nativia.com slash banking yes. to learn more about how you could uh, you know, sell banking services and all that. But also, if you go to nativia.com slash ISO, you'll learn more about how you can sell the services to get residual income, generate mm-hmm. margin and all that. One right. thing I wanted to highlight today, Patty, is the training course that I oh, created for excellent. Nativia. yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, when you sign up with Nativia Banking, one of the things that you get is my video course. I work with them on how to sell banking services and how to create uh, residual income off of that. Excellent. Uh, many of you may not really understand that world. If you go through this video course, uh, you will have a much better understanding of it. So make sure and ask about that when you reach out. Again, Nativia.com slash banking or Nativia.com slash ISO. Check it out. So Patty, I just want to follow up real quick on the whole content marketing thing and take a couple minutes. Um, you know, obviously something I'm really passionate about is, as mm-hmm. you know, and um, you know, the thing about it is that it works. That's the, the thing I wanted to say about it as I'm talking to Alan is I think it's such a great example when you watch, you know, listen to this interview or you get to watch it on YouTube and just to see Alan and see this, the shift in his business where, and you know, and again, he's not, you know, you go to follow him on LinkedIn, his posts aren't getting a thousand likes. They're getting 10, 15, 20 likes. And, but, I, but I think what happens is even his podcast, you know, I don't know how many listens he gets, but, you know, the thing I think is so interesting, Patty, with, uh, like, let's take a podcast as an example, right? Um, if I if I told somebody, hey, if you started a local podcast, I bet you could get 100 downloads a, a, a per episode. Right. Well, most people would be like, oh, that's not even worth it. That's nothing. If I, but if I said to them, hey, once a week, 100 local business owners are going to gather yeah. in a local stadium. And uh-huh. they're going to, they're going to let you speak to them for an hour. Right. Would you show up? Yeah, you would. Right. So why wouldn't you want to do a podcast that would get a hundred downloads and, and maybe you can get a lot more than that. But, right. you know, but I think a lot of times it's like, you miss the fact that, you know, you don't, you don't need thousands of people to consume your content. You just need that one every week mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To, to follow the content and then to reach out and, and have an interest. And I'm always amazed at kind of the serendipity of content marketing. You know, um, when we started doing this with CC storage, um, you know, one of the ICs. Right. I remember you, in fact, I remember when you started doing that. Yeah. yeah the self storage inside. I don't do it. The CEO of that company does it, but, but right. it's been amazing talking to him about just, we're so new. I mean, like we're, we're like this tiny little like fly on the back of the elephant right? of our competitors. Um, yeah, right, right. Our competitors are enormous. You know what I mean? Huge companies. And we're doing, you know, 20, 30, 40 mids a month. Like we're, we're nothing compared to them, but yet you wouldn't believe the people in that industry that have reached out to Ben and been like, Hey, can I get on your podcast? And like, and there's this, there's this reputation and this, this legitimacy that we get. And so many self-storage property owners that, you know, they'll fill out a forum on you know, or do a Google, Google AdWords or something, come to our website and then we'll call them and they won't pick up. And then two weeks later, they come back to the website and we talk to them. And they're like, well, I went to your website initially and I was kind of like, oh, I don't know. But then I was searching something else and then you popped up again and I saw your podcast and then I saw this ebook that you had and I was like, wow, this is the company uh-huh. I want to work with. Right. And so right. there's this validation. So it's not just top of the funnel. It's throughout the entire funnel. Exactly. It's it's how we all buy things today. If we're exactly. honest, like, we look right. into things, we research, we read. So that's how people are buying things. So let me just encourage you, just jump in. Okay. It's, it's actually not that expensive. It's not that that terrible or anything, you know, it is, does take some work. Um, but you could easily, if you started a podcast and said, I'm going to interview one small business owner every week in my local community. And you made a commitment to do that, get six or seven interviews ahead before you launch it. And then just launch the thing and see what happens. You're going to be shocked. And, and I think surprised six months down the road, how many leads right. you're getting and how much your business is growing. So yeah, anyway, it's going to deliver a lot of results for you if you really it do it the right way. Yeah. It is. So Agreed. that's my little plug for content marketing. It's just one of those things that not that complicated. There's plenty of, there's plenty of Pretty resources easy. out there online of how to do yep. it. You just yep. got to do it. So yeah. that's my thought today. Okay. So James, there's a movement afoot in Washington to clamp down on financial technology firms that skate, that skirt federal regulation. Okay. Now, just the other day, Rohit, Ch- Rohit Chopra, mm-hmm. he's the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, made a statement. He's probably one of the most vocal um, opponents of the status quo. 
He said, quote, large technology firms, including big, big tech firms, are leveraging their network effects in new ways. Some of these firms are larger than Wall Street's most dominant players, and they have been creeping into the financial system by developing networks that move payments and deposits. Hmm. Now, the CFPB has, a, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, they have a proposal out for comment that would give, an, give it oversight authority for non-bank companies, specifically those handling more than 5 million transactions a year, kind of in line with financial institution oversight. But now legislation has been introduced that would put the Fed in charge of regulating fintechs um, that act like banks, including those that have tapped into the federal deposit insurance apparatus. Hmm. It's called the Close the Shadow Banking Loophole Act. It was introduced by a group of bipartisan senators. It takes aims at specifically at industrial loan companies. Okay. Now, these are state chartered financial institutions that were created back in the early 20th century to provide loans to industrial workers, because at that time, bank accounts were a rarity among working class Americans. Right. Um, now, over time, ILCs, as they've been, as are more commonly referred to, have expanded offerings and have become a vehicle for companies that want to offer financial services comparable to those of banks and credit unions, but without the regulatory strings attached. They do this by leveraging a loophole in the Bank Holding Company Act, which established the Fed as the primary federal regulator for these for any kind of holding company involved in banking. Um, and so this is what re they refer to as the shadow banking system, is these companies. Now, Square is probably the most well-known fintech with an ILC charter. Its unit, Square Financial Services, Inc., operates Square Loans and Square Savings. And as a state chartered uh, financial institutions, these entities have FDIC coverage for deposits up to $250,000. Right. Now, under the proposed legislation, Square Financial Services would be regulated by the Fed, you know, in accordance with the rules for bank holding companies. Hmm. Um, interesting. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, I think that the, this legislation, um, you know, that adds the Fed, that adds Fed oversight to these entities um, you know, it's had a lot of support from from not only financial institutions, but a lot of consumer groups. There was this one group, the banking BPI. I, I I can't remember exactly what it stands for, but it's a group. It's a think tank that has that represents financial that has financial institution executives as well as consumer reps. And they sent a letter to Congress saying, hey, don't ignore this legislation. Hmm. So I think, you know, we're going to get some kind of legislation. It's going to be really interesting to see whether it's the Fed, the CFPB, or somehow they chop it up and divide it between the two. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Very interesting, Patty. Yeah, I'll be I'll be very interested to see how that plays out. I know a lot of players in that market. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that works. So, yeah, I think it will. I think good it will. Stuff. Thanks, Patty. Mm -hmm.